Welcome to the nose. Uh, I'll tell you who's on the nose, but first let me tell you what we're going to be talking about today. A little bit later on the show, we'll be talking about the, not the long fall, the short fall of Jimmy Fallon. He's, Jimmy Fallon's still fine, but he's losing ground in the ratings, seems to be losing ground in the zeitgeist. Kind of at a moment when I think, well, I think to a certain degree, certain other people have found the sweet spot, the way to talk about culture in a way that he hasn't right now. Jimmy Kimball in particular seems to be having a Goldilocks moment. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about... Um, our own kind of very late discovery, late to the party discovery of Chris Cornell, uh, the artist, the musical artist who died this week, associated with Soundgarden, Audio Slave, and also a burgeoning solo career. Uh, but I think we're going to talk about that more in terms of the way we don't know each other's music that well anymore. Uh, but we're going to begin with I Love Dick. I Love Dick, Dick is an eight-part TV series on Amazon. Uh, it is created by Jill Soloway, best known prior to this as the auteur behind Transparent. It takes place in Marfa, Texas. Marfa, Texas has become a hyper-precious uh, arts and ideas community for the people who think South by Southwest is way too crowded uh, and don't feel like going to Aspen. Uh, Marfa is where – Marfa is the place basically you can't get to in less than 15 hours, so it kind of weeds out the uh, people with low commitment. Uh, so Marfa is a real place, and it's a real scene. This satirizes it, and it satirizes it within the framework uh, of a hyped up and somewhat lost and confused uh, New York-based filmmaker played by Katherine Hahn. Uh, who arrives in Marfa with her husband, an intellectual played by Griffin Dunn, uh, and uh, immediately becomes obsessed with kind of, you know, one of the kind of reigning figures of this Marfa scene, the ultimate smart girl accessory, a rangy, stringy cowboy artist played by Kevin Bacon. Uh, there are other characters we'll talk about as well. Uh, some of the series is about the uh, triangle that forms among the three actors I've just named. Uh, a lot of it also is about, I think, blocked creativity um, and, um, well, I, well, well, let's figure out. Let's figure out together what else it's about. I don't know what it's about. Um, I know what I think it's about. Uh, joining us right now is Rich Holland. Uh, Rich Holland is a principal and design director at CoLab. Carolyn Payne, uh, actress, comedian, dancer, founder, director, choreographer of Kinetic Dance, and many other things besides, and uh, soon to be coming to a screen near you. Maybe we'll have a chance to mention that at some point today. Is it ready to be mentioned? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe we'll mention that later. <laughs> yeah. And Irene Pavoulis te teaches writing at Trinity College. So here we go. Um, I I've set it up as well as I can. Um, but um, we should also I should also say, Irene, that it's based on a book, a book which you made a point of acquiring. Yes. When I first read about the series in The New York Times a few months ago, I was like, I have to get this book. So I did. And, and if I could just and it's a very uh, it's not a book that I would recommend to most people because it's an uh, she writes a lot of letters. It's about a certain to this guy named Dick. And it's about a, it's from the perspective of a certain kind of woman that would be obsessed with somebody. And I if I could if I might I just have to read if you like this passage, you would like the book, all right? <laughs> oh, D, it's Thursday morning, 9 a.m., and I feel so emotional about this writing. Last night, I replaced you with an orange candle because I felt you weren't listening anymore, but I still need for you to listen because, don't you see, no one is. I'm completely illegitimate. So if you can relate to that feeling, you might like the book. <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, you, you can just get it and take a picture bother. and yeah. Instagram yeah, yourself. Yeah. Well, well, ex yourself. Explain that phenomenon in the All most right, PG-13 so, way you can. It, absolutely. <laughs> so my first uh, introduction to this book was people uh, Instagramming themselves with it, taking selfies with the book, with, you know, with the title, I Love Dick coming up with uh, witty hashtags. Some of them did make like a feminist, because it is, it, is, it is a feminist-driven novel in some ways, and it's, uh, but people would make some sort of claim to being a feminist on Instagram by reading this book and holding it up and taking ridiculous selfies and filtering them with duck face and this book. So that's how I became aware of this book, which obviously put it to me in kind of a, I, I didn't even think it was a real book. I thought it was some sort of, internet joke. Yeah, that's what I thought too. Yeah. Yeah, because of the title. Yeah, but I also think it's it's really interesting that they transposed it to to 2017 uh, because the book was written, she wrote it in the 90s when she was about 40. So she's of a certain generation, a sort of boomer generation that sort of uh, and a certain kind of corner of the art world of all these women that made sure to see all these Maya Darren movies, you know, with women lying at the at the at the ocean edge kind of staring into space romantically and then just watching them for a while and movies like that. So those of us who could can relate to that kind of thing sort of 
would feel a certain kind of attachment. But to transpose that to, to 2017, to the 21st century, I think it, it's, it makes it easy to ridicule in a way that um, I also can participate in, but I also <laughs> feel, wait a minute, wait a minute, she was trying to do something. Well, I think that there is some sort of disconnect. I think that uh, in the TV, now I, I have not read the book, but in the series, I had a lot of trouble relating to this character and kind of understanding where she was coming from. Well, let's, um, yeah. I want to hear Rich on this too, but let's get to know the TV series a little tiny bit here. Uh, this is from the uh, very first episode of uh, the TV series, uh, and we see the actress played by Catherine, uh, the, excuse me, the filmmaker played by Catherine Hahn in one of her first encounters with uh, Dick. Dick is this um, moody, cowboy artist uh, and sort of the Lord Supreme of the Marfa art scene played by Kevin Bacon. My guess is that she doesn't want to be a filmmaker because if you want to be a filmmaker, you'd be one. Oh. It's just a question of desire, not timing or talent or circumstance. It's pure want, which you don't possess. And don't confuse desire with entitlement around your filmmaking. Am I wrong? It's also a question of finances. If all it took was desire, Dick, there would be a, tr- a, a trove of amazing films by women filmmakers, but... No, no. Well, unfortunately, most films made by women aren't that good. See, I think it's really pretty rare for a woman to make a good film because they have to work from behind their oppression, which makes for some bummer movies. Sally Potter, Jane Campion. Excuse me. Susan Sontag, she, she was great. So uh, that's uh, all three voices from the film. Actually, you hear Griffin Dunn uh, talking as well as the somewhat beleaguered uh, husband of Catherine Hahn. So, you know, there's so many ways to go yeah. in at this, Rich. I don't know. Could we begin just talking about these performances? I, I actually, uh, uh, Irene and I have both finished the series now, you and um, uh, Carolyn about halfway through. But um, I actually think all of these people are giving really remarkable performances. Catherine Hahn is memorable to people who watched uh, Transparent, where she plays the sexy rabbi. I need to say nothing more than those two words. You know exactly who I'm talking about. Um, Griffin Dunn, of course, the son of Dominic Dunn from uh, Hartford and been in lots of movies, but uh, maybe has, you haven't seen him in anything in a while. Kevin Bacon, we don't have to tell you who Kevin Bacon is. I feel like they're all giving really remarkable performances. They're doing a great job. Um, uh, uh, Catherine Hahn has a lot to carry in this in this movie, um, and uh, she plays herself and her antithesis in this movie, and uh, and that's always a, a sort of complicated thing to do. Um, uh, on one level, and you know, this is me speaking personally as always. I think that she's sexy as hell, and um, and uh, and she embodies that um, sort of robust sensuality. Um, and then manages on a dime to turn it into this clumsy, oafish thing. Um, and you just can't quite pin her down. You can't pin her authenticity down. You can't pin uh, her struggle down. Well, do um, you believe that as the character, having those two? Or do you feel like absolutely. that's the acting? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I, I think that the whole thing just kind of wraps really nicely. Um, the uh, if there were any struggle uh, I would have with all of this um, is with some of the writing. Uh, I think that it, there's this tendency, and, and you could hear it in that clip. Uh, men are idiots in this, um, as far as I see. Uh, they they say things that are that are harsh and brash and and myopic. Um, and uh, and meanwhile, these women are exploring all of these corners and all of these complexity and guys to quote Kevin Bacon in this movie and in reference to his artwork. I like straight lines, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, you know, they can make statements like that and not be challenged. Uh, they can make statements like my what I think is my favorite line in this is uh, is when Ke- Kevin Bacon declares that he is post idea. Right. Um, and uh, and that's completely acceptable. And yet um, when the women are, are struggling with similar kinds of, of tensions and conflicts um, and presenting their process live, it's completely unacceptable. See, yeah, I, I, I want to sort of play with that for just a second, uh, Carolyn. Actually, I had a slightly different reaction. And it may be conditioned a little bit by having uh, gone, gotten all the way through where the men get uh, a little bit of redemption. I think uh, they creep towards some redemption as they go along. But uh, first of all, I'm a big Catherine Hahn fan from Transparent. In this, I 
If there's a problem that I have with this series, it's Catherine Hahn. Uh, I find her a little hard to watch at times. Yeah. This performance is so hyped up and mannered, and it's she's kind of like Woody Allen on cocaine, um, and and she's verbally thrashing around. She's physically thrashing around, and she's simultaneously great and a little bit hard to watch for more than three or four minutes. I I, I agree with you. I found her to be normally. I I find her incredibly uh, just kind of like just this easy realness that she just gets across in in her performances. Like she, she's been really consistent for me and I think she's like a really strong comedian. I think she's a mess in this. And I don't know if this is what they, like her hair is a mess. She looks a mess. Her, her performance just seems like sloppy sometimes. Like it's just missing a mark. Like I, I and I, I don't know if that, is a character that she was creating, if that was directed out of her, if this is just kind of like a, a miss in some ways. But there was just something really like out of control for her in this that okay, I, I so, couldn't grasp. All right. Well, and, and I would say that goes back to the to the original book because she was really playing that character. And I think mm -hmm. that character is really hard to watch. Mm -hmm. That's the same reason why the book is hard to read because you just want to say, oh, come on. You know, and she's just like, let me scrape it against the bone a little bit more, like just pushing and pushing and pushing. And even though some part of me relates to that, I also can just feel like, oh, come on, stop, stop. Just, just you know, just comb your hair, yeah. <laughs> but but yeah. didn't you say, oh, come on, through the entire 90s? <laughs> um, <laughs> that would be a yes. That's a solid yes. <laughs> well, actually, I'm also shortchanging somebody. There's a fourth performance that's worth talking about here and really is a whole other leg of this series. Uh, a virtual unknown named Roberta Calindra is playing Devin. Devin is a uh, lesbian artist slash playwriter, but somebody much more uh, rooted in this community, not uh, an out-of-towner slumming in the high desert, but someone who's really from there and somebody who's really going through her own crisis uh, about who she's going to be and how she's going to make her mark on the world. Um, this performance, in a way, see, one of the things, that Rich, that I like about Catherine Hahn usually is that I want more. I want, I like, with Transparent, I thought, I want even more of her. I want to see that character more. I want to know more about that character. Whereas in this role, she kind of vomits up everything about herself. <laughs> you know, every single time the camera looks at her, she's just like vomiting up everything. Whereas there is a real mystery to this character, Davin. I really, as some of her story is revealed, I feel like I'm on this very interesting date where I'm getting to know this person in a, in a very slow and measured and mm -hmm. fascinating fashion. I was, I was oh, oh, yeah. That. I was throwing that at you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll accept that. Um, there's a there's a, a thing that we were discussing just before the show started, and it's a personal thing that I get intimidated by people who have their act together, and particularly if they're tall. <laughs> and um, and so uh, the sloppier you get, yeah. uh, the happier I get, and the more comfortable I become. Right. And, uh, what should we make of the fact that Rich seems to be not intimidated by any of us? Well, yeah, well, he, not, what he described not, was like me now. entirely. I am a short mess. <laughs> and he so. seems to have his act together really well, too. Yeah, it's all a lie. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I also want to talk, uh, Irene, a little bit about what's being made fun of here. Like something's yeah. being yeah. made fun of, and it's, and it's done very well. And a lot of the, in a lot of this movie, show, I'm laughing. Although half the time I sort of want to hit the pause button and think a little bit about what I'm laughing at. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. the, clearly, one thing that's being made fun of is kind of the state – of the modern hyper intellectual community, right? That there's first of all, this movie, uh, movie, it's this series is like a crash course in post feminist filmmaking, uh, the state of women created fine arts uh, in America. Uh, uh, many names are dropped that I didn't recognize or had to look up or had to figure out. But but while all that's happening, there's something intensely silly about this this Marfa scene, which is a real life scene. I mean, she's first of all making fun of a scene that I think most people are completely unaware of. I mean, you, you have to tell people that Marfa, Texas is a real real I thing. I had and, to Google that. And, <laughs> it, and as often I do with things on the show, I had to Google and see what was happening. But I it, this show kind of had a Portlandia vibe to me. But it was like Marfandia, which is an awful word. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? Like, you know, like that show Portlandia sort of yeah. takes this like hipster, artsy culture and, and the characters that surround it and make it. And this this show kind of in at least in the first couple episodes, there was that vibe for me like the, this. 
Uh, but, but I, okay, go ahead. No, no, well, you, all right, so there, it's also the thing about the visiting, like the intellectual community, mm -hmm. you know, where everybody, there's these fellows, they're called fellows, you know, and they're all here and they're all here to have discussions. And the first scene is so funny because she doesn't want to go to the party and meet all the people because she's the wife of the fellow, but she's there and she doesn't want to be there and the way they see her. Oh, you're the, oh, the wife she's of the, the Holocaust wife. Oh, guy. you like my, the you know, Holocaust you'd wife. like my wife, the Holocaust wife because that's what he works on. And just the awkwardness of those kind of, of, of those kind of, event, of events where you're supposed to be sort of schmoozing with people and they're all sort of sizing each other up and feeling awkward and, and uncomfortable. It's it's funny because because it's so because it happens so much and everybody has to pretend that they're like the kind of people that Rich is intimidated by, even though they're not. Yeah, I think that um, every sort of uh, subculture, for for lack of better words, uh, is mockable mm -hmm. uh, until you're in it. Um, or sometimes even if you are. <laughs> well, sure, that's yeah. fair. Um, but I think that there is something that grows out of that kind of extreme uh, introspection and, and analysis of things that has tremendous value. Um, and uh, and it, the, the struggle that I have with this series is I could hang into this study of obsession and this study of, you know, of what do you do when, when you don't fit in? How do you claim your own? Um, a heck of a lot more than I could, that I, than I could um, settle in with the context that they're playing this out in. Um, uh, I think, too, uh, we, we've also been having this conversation about this, uh, this painting recently that sold for $110 million plus. And um, this is Jean Michel Jean Michel Basquiat's, Basquiat's. Um, Untitled. Yeah, and uh, and setting uh, a new kind of record. But it seems like there's other stuff that sold for more, so I don't quite understand the record. Um, but nevertheless, uh, what's the kind of um, intellectual um, over discipline that happens in some of these places is setting the bed uh, for this kind of economic driver to happen. You know that once that once that painting once we could actually start defining a getting clear on the vocabulary uh, for discussing these achievements for discussing these issues, um, we create a context for more of that to happen. I do want to you know when I was thinking today that. I'm ready to go back and watch the Basquiat movie, mm -hmm. which I had forgotten. It stars Jeffrey Wright, who's gone on yeah. to have this tremendous career as Basquiat, and Benicio del Toro is his buddy from the hood who shoots hoops with him, you know, in some neighborhood in New York. And I think David Bowie is, uh, is Andy, Andy Warhol. Warhol, right? Yeah. And I mean, just like this amazing cast. And I kind of do want to go and see it because I think in some ways – my dim recollection of that movie is that it does prick the sensibilities a little bit of the Warhol-dominated mm -hmm. part of I mean, because Basquiat is coming in from the streets with a very different kind of, you know, very earthy kind of vision. In a way, he's sort of, you know, the Kevin Bacon of New York City. He's like real. He's trying to be real anyway. Right. Um, but all of this seems <laughs> – the minute you say it, it sounds kind of mockable to use your – Right, term. exactly. Um, I, you know, and when you take a look at how e – even in that movie, how the, the factory scene was drawn, it seemed completely ridiculous. But such incredible value actually came out of that. Um, I am hoping that as the series evolves – we can start seeing some of the value that comes out of some uh, out of the exercises that are going through in Marfa. Well, actually, just to sort of maybe wrap this up because we've got a couple of other interesting topics we want to get to. But um, uh, so, Irene, you and I. First of all, we'll start. No, actually, we'll start with the people who haven't finished. Um, so, um, Carolyn, one of the things that I, I will say is that as I was watching this unfold, and I had this experience with Jill Soloway's work generally, there are episodes that make me want to keep going, and episodes that make me think, eh. I don't really care whether I see this to the end or not. Um, and they alternate uh, often. But uh, she hasn't really, I get the feeling she hasn't really set the hook for you. At all. I, I mean, <laughs> honestly, like, I probably, if I didn't have to discuss this today, I probably would have stopped in the middle of episode one. <laughs> Just well. real talk here. Like, I had to push myself to get... And then, like, episode two, I was like, all right, I'm kind of on board. I, like, sort of want to see what happens. But... It just, for me, like, I, I couldn't, the, the soundtrack is great. Like, the whole thing has this, like, pretty Instagram filter in the film style. Um, but I, I couldn't, and, and the acting, Kevin Bacon is good in it. He's really, I thought he, I thought he was really interesting. And yeah. I find something about him fascinating. Like, his face and his expressions and everything about him, I think, is fascinating in this. But 
Yeah, I mean, definitely it's the kind of thing, like, check it out and see if it hooks you in, but I'll, I'll be probably not finishing this. <laughs> ba- Baking gets better and better in this role and fleshes out his character to a tremendous degree. It might be my favorite performance of his that I've seen ever um, by the time he's done with it. So, Rich, how about you? Are you... Uh uh, Are you I'm, here for the stay, or I'm here for the stay. Yeah. Uh, I was a little um, tentative at the. At, I wasn't sure about the first uh, episode um, because you know you're doing all this setup, and there's also from a um, from a director's point of view, uh, the first episode was just massively overly directed. Um, there were these freeze frames that were happening. It was just mm-hmm. too much packed into a very small amount of time, um, but. It's starting to even out. It's it's established its vocabulary by the second episode, and uh, it's easy to take in. And I just want to see um, where these characters go. And to your point about um, about uh, the Chris character, uh, um, Catherine Hahn's character in this, uh, she just keeps throwing up more stuff over <laughs> and over again. And I'm just wondering what happens when we get to the bottom of that well. Right. Uh, it's so now we get to maybe even sort of make a recommendation one way or the other. We've uh, been all the way through. I mean, would you recommend this to to most people? Some people. Like, you had yeah. some um, qualifications about the book. Uh, How about the TV no, series? No, and the movies. Actually, I think in a way, when I first in the first couple of episodes, I had a feeling that wasn't completely different from Carolyn's in the sense of saying like because I felt like they were making fun of it too mm-hmm. much. It, it was just too too cynical. Yeah. I thought. But as it, if, but if you go all the way through to the end, it 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 tried to redeem itself, and and, and I think her performance, the sort of desperation of her performance, I think is is just so great, and it's sort of asking the question about like what is a real emotion in the first place, you know, where are the real emotions, and what is real art too? I think it's trying to ask. And uh, so I really admire it for that. I don't think it's perfect, but I, I really admire it for that. So, yes, I would recommend it. I, I just want to say that I would recommend it. I think, first of all, it's a series that will, within three episodes, sort you out pretty quickly. <laughs> you know, I mean, the people who aren't, don't want to watch this, they're going to know within maybe even halfway through the first episode, to, to Carolyn's point. Uh, and, and it is a lot of it depends on what you're up for. Uh, and, and I think this series, I'm, first of all, amazed that this got made. You know, yeah. even at Amazon, the, to, to pitch something like this, um, because once you get past the sexy title, the sexy funny title, this is there's a lot of hard going intellectually in this. I mean, you're rewarded constantly by interesting, funny people. But, I mean, really, I, I had to look up a ton of stuff just to even understand some of the references that were being made. I didn't know who Chantal Ackerman is. I mean, you really— <laughs> I have to say, I feel like they are just, like, trying to dupe people into watching this based on the funny title and the, the picture, like the ad that's, like, on the billboards and everything, right. the, like, lipstick and the bullet— that to me, as I started watching it, became more and more bizarre. Like I felt like that it was that was gimmicky and unnecessary for this. Anyway, its its brains are in evidence all all the way through. I think its heart uh, grows uh, bigger as it goes along, and and you really start to uh, maybe believe in these people. Griffin Dunn, uh, we just ha- I have to say, is also really really yeah. good in this. I, it's a very very interestingly calibrated performance by him. He, he's just terrific, and so it's fun to watch him. He's also left-handed. I always have to point out who's left-handed. All right. Can, can I add one, yeah, one yeah, recommendation yeah, 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 yeah. to yeah. this? Is um, if the kids are awake, lower the volume. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> That's probably a pretty good idea. Uh, all right. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back. We've got two more topics that we need to tackle. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time passing. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time ago. Where have all the flowers gone? Young girls pick them everywhere. All right. So uh, we talked about how maybe audiences sort themselves out, either liking or not liking uh, I Love Dick. By the way, the thing you heard at the end of the uh, last um, uh, the last little bit of the previous segment was, in fact, Marlena Dietrich singing Where Have All the Flowers Gone, uh, part of the eclectic and hypnotic uh, soundtrack to I Love Dick. All right. But another way we sort ourselves out, I think, is sort of what our late night choices are, because uh, you have a lot, a lot of late night choices these days in terms of comedy. I mean, you can not watch it at all, which is what a lot of people do. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, otherwise, you're a cold bear person, you're a Fallon person, you're a Kimmel person. We can throw in a few others. Um, and right now, it does seem, and the New York Times made quite a bit of hay about this this week uh, in a piece by David Scoff, that Fallon's having a little bit of a fall, that his ratings are as good as they used to, but maybe a little bit more 
more importantly, because his ratings will always be good enough to guarantee him employment. But there's sort of a sense in which he's missing the mark here somehow, that uh, the, the kind of show that he puts together isn't necessarily the kind of show that people want to see and talk about and relish uh, right now. Um, so um, I, I'll still go around the table. I mean, Rich, I'll start with you. I mean, first of all, uh, where do you land on all this stuff? Well, I've never been a, I've never been very much of a Fallon fan uh, in the same way I wasn't very much of a Jimmy Carson fan. Um, it didn't speak to, to the stuff that's of interest to me. Um, that said, um, well, yeah, it's going to topple. What, what I think needs to happen uh, for all of these folks is you need a brand that's, that has some diversity to it, that has some range. And uh, Fallon's been playing to an incredibly, incredibly narrow range all along. Um, it's, it's a little opie. It's a little aw shucks. And, um, and, you know, in a time that's, that's calling for, you know, protestation by and large, um, you're going to find that happening. I'm finding that, it, you know, even in, in sort of my own experiences, uh, the folks who are saying, you know, oh, just get away from the politics, ignore that stuff, just go out and smell the flowers are folks that are getting dismissed pretty quickly in, in my life. And I think that we're uh, in a place where that's happening more and more. I, I totally agree. But I think, I mean, I'm a Trevor Noah person. Mm -hmm. He is so good. Every, last night he was just so, I mean, every night he's so, so, so good, I think. And he has, you know, what you would like. But for me, I think I know when, when Jimmy Fallon start when the, when the slide began, which was when he must Trump's mm -hmm. hair, yes. you know, and it was just so, everybody was just shocked that so he the, was yeah, being so playful. This is, this is during the campaign. He had sit-downs with both candidates. Uh, a lot of softball questions, not a lot of hardball questions, but I think that was sort of maybe understood going in. But yeah, he did. He wanted to experience the reality of Donald Trump's hair. And, and so actually, I thought in a way it was pretty. It was a pretty funny thing to do because it seems like Donald Trump is is vain about his hair. He's <laughs> he's he's he's, he's uh, you know uncomfortable about it. You know, and so just to say, hey, can I touch your hair and can I muss it up? But that's but that but people myself included, felt like, no, no, that's too much chumminess. Yeah. Yeah. So, Carolyn, and that was the, scripted. as the comedy professional yeah, here. Yeah. yeah. So the comedy landscape is huge, you know, and there's a, a lot of room for people to mine different parts of it. Um, at least typically there is. And th th there's really never been any real uh, burden borne by late night t comedy to comment meaningfully uh, about the political scene, unless you're talking about John Stewart and Stephen Colbert and now Trevor Noah, yeah. but for the most part, it's like you know. And Bill, Samantha B. I always Samantha feel like B. I have to yeah. like throw her in. She's my right. favorite, yeah. and, yeah. I, okay. I, and I, I always want her to get a solid shout out. <laughs> right, although she's weekly. I see we people, yeah. who, people who work daily. We identify see, with her for daily. That is. I, I know, and I appreciate the like grind of a daily show, but I almost feel like it's enough for me that it is weekly. I have never been a late night TV watcher, to mm -hmm. be honest. Uh, I, I I feel like, you know, when I was like in high school and college, you had like Letterman and Leno, and I, I never really watched it, so I've never gotten into a pattern. The only thing I see of late night is like the morning after if people are sharing it on their social media. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like for. And I, th I think that that is true for a lot of people in my age group that, you know, we're going to just kind of get like a clip of what of the best of what happened. So I feel like that's how I look at it. Like if I see like this week, Jimmy Fallon uh, broke where Trump's uh, commencement speech was like Elle Woods from Legally Blonde. Actually, let's let's hear that right that now. Was so funny. But I was watching. I watched Trump's commencement speech and it sounded kind of familiar. I think it actually reminded me of Elle Wood's speech from Legally Blonde. <laughs> See if you can tell what I mean. We take our next steps into the world. You must go forth into the world. It is with passion. Passion. Courage of conviction. Courage in your convictions. And most importantly. Most importantly. Have faith in yourself. Be true to yourself. We did it! I did it. <laughs> It's, it's probably just a coincidence. It's probably just a coincidence. Oh, my God. I don't even know how we connected the two or whoever wrote that. That's fantastic. 
So that's really great. And yeah. we maybe even wish that Jimmy did even more of that kind of thing. Yes. Although he's very, I mean, Jimmy Fallon's very good at certain things. He's a fabulous impressionist. Um, you know, his, his musical impersonations are just legendary and justifiably so. Although I have always found him to be kind of disturbingly lightweight. Even mm-hmm. even within the context of Saturday Night Live, he seemed kind of lightweight. He was uh, always a, breaking. Yeah, for the source of frustration. Tracy Morgan and other performers who worked with him called him eventually on the fact that he broke, broke character all yeah. the time and would dissolve into giggles uh, in a script that needed something a little bit more from him. And and I I do think that you know late night television is an odd place, and so you know. Some people are going to gravitate towards the Trevor Noahs of this world, but a lot of people are looking for the last thing they're going to watch before they fall asleep. Uh, they don't necessarily want the gears of their brains grinding over anything terribly complex. On the other hand, you know, Trump is such a pervasive conversational presence that you can't ignore him. It's sort of why I think you know Jimmy Kimmel recently just got renewed for the um, Oscars for a second straight time, which. Uh, has not happened very much in recent years. I feel like Kimmel's found this little sweet spot here. He's kind of a little bit more middle American. You know, he's he's having the Goldilocks moment. He's, you know, he had the thing with his his own uh, child's heart condition where he spoke very uh, profoundly and personally about this and in a way that was very finger wagging at, at uh, the Trump and Republican health care plan. Um, and I think that maybe sort of undergirded him a little bit so that, you know, he... Prior to that, I would have said he wasn't too much more topical or incisive or biting than Fallon. But now it's sort of like, I don't know, I'm like more intrigued by Jimmy Kimmel. Well, I do think that 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 kind of, to be honest, I forgot he was still on the air until I saw those clips. Again, I I feel like there there there's so many options Mm -hmm. now. And, you know, there's a late show and a late, late show. And then there are cable shows and there's just so many choices. So you have to really find something that is your... Is, is your niche and, 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 and stick with it and, and figure out what makes you funny and how you can cope with what is happening and make it funny. Yeah. And I, I think like Jimmy Fallon, you know, I, I think that his kind of, I think you said in an email, Rich, his Pee Wee Herman persona of this like man child I, I, <laughs> that he has going on. I think he is going to have to start to evolve that a little to keep up. It's, on the other hand, I do feel as though – so one thing that I w- I've been thinking watching Kimmel recently is when you lose Jimmy Kimmel, you've lost middle America. You know, kind of the way when Walter Cronkite finally said, look, the Vietnam War is just not working out. It was like everyone went, whoa. Uh, and there's a way in which, you know, Stephen Colbert doesn't have anything left to throw at Trump. He's thrown everything he's got. He can just throw everything every night, night after night after night. And, and you know, with people – somebody like Kimmel, you can sort of imagine I mean, the more caustic he becomes – about Trump, the more he's speaking, maybe for middle America. And yeah, I just don't think Jimmy Fallon is ready to put those man pants yeah. on yet. Um, all right, we're going to do a quick topic switch. Uh, this week, uh, Chris Cornell uh, died. He's perhaps not a name that means anything to you. I will confess his name meant essentially nothing to me, although I did know the names of Soundgarden and Audio Slave, two bands in which he participated. And I guess, therefore, I kind of maybe sort of almost knew he was part of the grunge scene. Um, since then, I've made an effort to discover his work. Um, and maybe before we discuss that fact, let's hear this is uh, by Soundgarden. This is called a Spoon Man. So that's your grunge. So first of all, um, I think probably age-wise, uh, Carolyn, you might be our best hope of somebody who has any relationship with this music at all. Uh, sorry, I might nope. be. You do? Yeah, yeah I, I was going to say, I'm, I'm a little... <laughs> do you so, too like, young? Grunge yeah. took off, like I was in like late elementary, like to junior high. And so grunge was like what you aspired to, to be cool. Yeah. yeah uh, you know, like we were wearing flannel shirts over our Nirvana tees, but not mm. really quite there knowing what we were listening to. Yeah, I may have you in the wrong age cohort because you were on our David Bowie show. That was the first time you appeared on this particular radio program, I think. Right. So so you're well, you're a little bit more in the grunge pipeline. Yeah, I'm in that I'm in that mid fifties age group. Yeah. Uh and I'm singing along to Spoon Man on the yeah. radio here. Um uh and this morning I was listening to stuff like Black Hole Sun, uh acoustic which is kind of what I need right now because my bones that are That is old. a great song. It is an amazing yeah. song. And yeah. um, okay, so, so uh, 
that movement was was incredibly important. Uh, mm-hmm. We needed to to figure out what to do. Uh, New Age created a, a disaster for folks who um, who wanted to be very sort of viscerally awake, mm-hmm. and um, and so coming out of this sort of punk phase and you know what we ended up with was you know was like big shoulder pads and boy george um and you know an awful lot of what was happening in in those mid 80s points boy uh when when folks like you know like soundgarden and um and uh pearl jam and you know and when these folks came back on the scene in a in a more popular way not just an underground way that's hard to access uh it connected folks like me back to uh, to what our roots were. Um, so so this is a this is kind of a, a big deal moment. Now the interesting thing that's happening for me is uh, as I was getting connected to Chris Connell uh, to to Chris as a as an um, as a solo artist uh, for this show, I spent the bulk of a day just listening to him do covers mm-hmm. and. Boy, I had not recognized, you know, because of all the sort of uh, dynamic compression and intensity of the production uh, that happens with bands like Soundgarden, to actually hear his voice clean. I was it's shocked. It's a remarkable yeah. tool. It's yeah. a remarkable tool. He's kind of the, the Placido Domingo of grunge. I mean, he's, uh, I was listening to him sing Ave Maria with Eleven as I pulled into the parking lot just now. Um, but, I mean, Irene, I think this also speaks to the fact that uh, – we're and I've discovered this a lot while we, we, we when we've done usually when somebody dies but not always uh, but when we do stuff on the notes I, I we off, always have the panelists picked before we know what we're going to talk about uh, on one occasion uh, Mercy Quay down in New Haven who's a young African American woman we were going to be talking about Paul Simon he hadn't died but he had a new album out and she said she had to ask people who that was she didn't know who Paul Simon was uh, Tanisha Dugan uh, didn't know who Leonard Cohen was I didn't know who Chris Cornell was and I don't think you did either. And it sort of speaks to these silos we're in musically. Mm-hmm. It, it is a, that, that somebody could be that meaningful to people who live and work uh, and socialize around you and me and, and for us not to really even know who that is. I don't know. How does that happen? I know. And it's not only generational. It's somewhat generational. Though I have to just as a parenthesis say like that song that you just played reminded me of Long Island Acid Rock from when I was in high school. Like Mountain, Felix Popularity and Mountain. Mm-hmm. You know, it was the same kind of guitar. You know, that I, that I personally used to love. So I, I Soundgarden not often sounds like cream to me. Too. Cream yeah. Yeah. and yeah, like Jimi Hendrix with his some of it. And anyway, so in a way, you, you said that you you that you went back to it. You know, mm-hmm. so it's it's interesting how the types of music go in cycles. And now there's whereas like, like grunge was kind of my awakening to music. I mm-hmm. do feel like because that was like the first time that I, you know that was the age where you're aware of and starting to develop taste and everything. So I feel like grunge was my like music awakening yeah. and so it was interesting to hear that for you it like took you back yeah grunge is i feel and, like what and, got me yeah. but and it's an interesting you know like I, I feel like i was thinking about that for me like what kind of you know i i've like boyfriends influenced it so much you know i had my jazz boyfriend in college <laughs> and i had my reggae <laughs> boyfriend and then i had my motown and then i had my indie rock this is starting to sound married. like an episode of i love dick yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and right. write them some letters. <laughs> and so those are <laughs> those are all you know. Those are my silos in a way. You know, like who was what were they listening to more than what I was? You know, I've never been on Spotify or, or some one of those things, and I always say that I should be. You know, because I usually just sort of draw take in music from what other people. There's some that I follow on my own, but I don't know. So. Yeah. Anyway, everybody, it's who you, music. it's who your friend, who you value, and also certain kinds of music are associated with a certain kind of coolness or way of being, and so I think that it's who you're attracted to in terms of that. Right. I mean, for me, I feel like for many years now, soundtracks are a huge influence in what I listen to. Like I'll hear a song and then I'll look that up and look up that artist and you know just kind of like fall in love with things from from that. Uh, yeah. I, I think that I agree with Irene that like a lot of who you like it relates to people that introduced it to you or like uh, you know if you had a really good summer like you remember the songs from that summer 
um, and, and or, or yeah. just a time in your life where you remember like certain songs that go with that. And I think that that's kind of. But maybe there's less universalization of that yeah. now. You know, yeah. like you don't. It's not. We don't all hear the same anything. Right. I, I, yeah. That's absolutely the case. And I think it's also never been easier to discover new music, and never been harder to. There. You know. You, if you're gonna, if you're gonna make the effort. I mean, one thing that I I'll say is so my streaming service. Uh, is title it's T I D A L, um, and one of the things that they did right away is cough up for me this very nice Chris Cornell mm-hmm. playlist that starts with and it's a mix you know it starts with Can't Change Me which is uh, from one of his solo efforts but then there's some Soundgarden and some Audio Slave and Temple of the Dog which we're going to go out of this uh, segment with and some of his collaborations with his Zach Brown he liked to collaborate with lots mm-hmm. of different people so I mean and I just started listening to it and I thought well why didn't I listen to any of this ever before but but I was really quite captivated by it. I mean, one of the things that I do with streaming services now, my streaming services, I use it to force myself to learn about music that I'm not going to learn about. Because I think we don't do it by osmosis anymore. No, you have to claw your way in. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> kind of the way. Yeah. Back, um, back in the day, um, uh, there was this thing called a record store. Right. And uh, and I used to, it was it was almost sort of like instead of like folks go to the gym now I would go to the record store mm-hmm. and just start at A, and and uh, and some of these weren't organized by section so mm-hmm. all the A's were together and if I saw something that looked interesting uh, I buy it mm-hmm. and I I heard all kinds of fascinating things so I'm trying Reading to replicate the album covers and everything yeah. was so great yeah. You know, and so I'm trying to replicate that with yeah. Spotify. It's you know, I'm I'm having some success of hearing things that I that you know I wouldn't ordinarily uh, stumble into. You know, I found this new electronic uh, uh, stuff called um, by a performer called uh, FKA Twigs. Yes. Oh, listen to that. Oh my God, she's amazing. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. Amazing. Well, one thing. Um, yeah, oh, sorry. But it has Go nothing on. to do with Soundgarden. Okay, right. Well, I but I, and I also have to say that it's so annoying because some people, as they get older, sort of hold on to the music mm-hmm. they like and they scoff at anything else and they refuse to listen to it. And I think that's really frustrating too. That people just get so locked in that they want to stay in there. You know, like no, don't don't play any of that other music. Yeah. I can't relate to that kind of music, and that just bothers me. All right, yeah. so we're we're gonna um, t- take a break here. I think just in order to, I do want to say first of all um, that so I don't get fifteen emails about this that uh, there are still some of the great record stores left, and including Red Door. <laughs> Red Door, Red Door, Red, whatever it's called. Red Scroll, Red Scroll. I knew it was either Red Door or Red Scroll. I actually did know it was one of those two. It's Red Scroll. Uh, there's that wonderful walk down place too up in Northampton, Massachusetts. I mean, once again, you have to claw your way to these places mm-hmm. and find them, but they still do exist and you can go hang out and pretend that you're the young, rich Holland. Uh, meanwhile, we're going to take a little break. We're going to come back. We're going to make some recommendations. I'm still reeling from the disclosure that I Love Dick has nothing to do with Senator Blumenthal. Today's show was produced by Jonathan McPants and me, Kyone Wolf. The post-feminist films of Amanda Fish are available on our website, and the part of Bill Curry was played by Zeppo Bacon. We'll be back on Monday trying to piece together what happened when the president went to Saudi Arabia. And now, back to Colin. I know. I just can't wait. Uh, Mark Silk, who is uh, something of an expert uh, at Trinity on um, politics and religion, will be joining me for that, for some of that show anyway, if not all of it. Uh, All right. It's time to make some uh, recommendations. Let's start with you, Carolyn. 
All right. Uh, my recommendation is another Amazon Prime series that uh, I, I did want to watch more than one episode of. Uh, it's in its third season, Catastrophe. It is so brilliant. And this season is kind of bittersweet because Carrie Fisher is in it. And it's actually uh, the last project that she filmed. And it is just, it is so funny and so raw. And um, Sharon Horgan, who's this... Uh, British, I, th I think she's actually Irish comedian who co-created this, is brilliant. Um, she, I just completely idolize her, and everyone should check out this series. All right. Okay. And Irene, what have you got for um, us? Three things. One, male rompers. Um, <laughs> yes. Two, um, Get Out, which we talked about on the nose once, right. um, is playing at Cine Studio tonight and tomorrow, Ooh. and it's such a great thing to watch on the big screen, a cross between a horror movie and guess who's coming for di to dinner. Um, <laughs> and so if you haven't seen it, go, go to Cine Studio and just go to Cine Studio in general because they have great mo movies there. Um, also, my colleague from Trinity, Pablo Delano, who's a yeah. photographer, is having an exhibit at the um, Hartford Public Library. There's an opening tonight at 6, but the pictures will be there for a while. He's take He takes beautiful photographs, and these are of Hartford's built environments, so it's all very local, and you can find the places that he's photographed and I think it should be a lovely exhibit. Did you want to say like 30 seconds about what you mean when you say male rompers? <laughs> yes. Um, rompers that look like what little kids wear or what Caroline has. Caroline I am has wearing a, happy a business suit. romper today. Mm -hmm. It looks like I'm ready to do some business in this nice blouse and shorts but it's our skort really. And uh, But yeah, I think rompers are great. And it's they started with babies, then they went to women, to girls and women. Mm -hmm. Now they're very popular with women. Like Rompers for everyone. Carolina. I'm Carolina. all for it. Now men are wearing them. Yeah. yeah. All right. I approve. <laughs> all right. You're so up. for me. Um, you're not wearing a romper. I, I want to vouch for the not wearing Rich a romper. Holland but you not would. wearing a romper. Without a doubt. <laughs> um, so Theater Works is opening a, a new play called Fade uh, by Tanya Sirocco. Uh, my take on it is it's about the uh, degeneration of authenticity when art and commerce intersect. Um, when theater work does these openings, they create an event uh, called uh, Meet the Artist. That's happening on the 24th, which is Wednesday of this week, like 6.30 or so, um, in the gallery at Theater Works. I happen to uh, be the artist that they will be meeting, uh, mm. one of the artists. So I've got an exhibit of my work there. The oh. show's called This Time is Kind of Like the Last Time. And uh, and as a bonus for folks who are showing up at the opening, I'll be doing actual uh, work, artwork with the folks who are there. So we'll be making stuff together. So All right. happening. Wow. That sounds great. All right, so in honor of Chris Cornell and the conversation we just had, I decided I would make musical recommendations, one uh, very old uh, and one very new. So um, the very old one is, um, although he's also very new, I guess, um, the, the voice that you hear usually at the end of the nose, and I think you'll be hearing today, uh, belongs to Grayson Hugh. Grayson Hugh is one of the first live musicians, I think, you know, that I heard as a young guy. He was a musician around here. Uh, I imprinted on him like a baby duck. I've always loved his music. He'll be performing tonight uh, at Center Church uh, right in downtown Hartford at 7 p.m. with Polly Messer. Um, always worth it. Uh, amazing voice, amazing uh, way with uh, what is sometimes called blue-eyed soul. I also want to recommend, uh, th and it couldn't be newer than this, uh, lo the rapper Logic has just dropped uh, an album called Everybody. Uh, it's the third in what I think is a four-album sequence. I didn't know much about him, but I this is one of these things where you really have to spend time with the album, too. You can't cherry-pick it very well, I don't think. Uh, although, if you want to listen to, say, one song, I would recommend Confess, which involves uh, Killer Mike as well. Th this is, it it's Amazing. The critics have not been super kind to this, but I actually re regard it as just a virtuosic performance, both musically and verbally. And it's very much about his own split identity. He's biracial, but it's about a lot of other stuff too. I, I don't know how. Uh, I, if you have any threshold for this, any ability to listen to hip hop music, which I realize is perhaps a small percentage of the public radio audience, please. Uh, Engage a little bit with this. Everybody by logic. All right, thanks so much to Rich Holland and to Irene Kapoulis and to Carolyn Payne. We'll see you on Monday. Should be an exciting day. Mondays seem to be very exciting these days, but then so do Tuesdays. Hey, do you want to, I don't know, get more comfortable? You want to stay over?
Yeah. Let me just get out of this romper. No, no, no. Keep it on. 